You found us through fly fishing. You'll stay for our passion and the community. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. Yeah, but he doesn't get it. How come fly fishermen don't get it? You only haul with the short power snap. Look for where people walk and the insides of bends and hunt those. The roof blew off and the interior walls got sucked out and the trees are just coming up. And I mean, he's clearly not going to clear the trees. It is not a fly fishing story. It's a story about me trying to understand my brother through fly fishing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We've been waiting for you. Follow our guests, follow us on Instagram, and share this episode and the love if you enjoy this podcast. And we are live in three, two, one. Tim, how you doing, man? Dave, I'm doing great. I think, is this our third podcast we've done together now? Yeah, we're rolling, man. This is the, we've done a lot of, I mean, I always think with you, I first think fly tying, you know, that's kind of my first thing. Cause I think when I first ran episode 25, so shout out to 25, which is first season, you came on when we were nothing. We were a little speck on the podcast. Map <laughs> you were you something, you were something, <laughs> calm down. You helped get us going. So, I mean, that was now 285. We did another episode, and now I think we're in the mid-500s. So, um, so this is great, Tim. I appreciate you coming on. Today, we're going to talk travel. You've been doing a lot of travel. We want to talk travel tips for people listening, um, get into all that. But um, maybe just walk us back. I always like to start. The last episode was a couple hundred or so ago. <laughs> uh, what's been going on the last couple years with you since we last chatted? Oh, my gosh. I guess it has been a couple of years. I mean, in the last couple of years, tons have changed. I still continue to you know, focus on my YouTube channel. It's kind of shifted a little bit away from fly tying where it's more about fly fishing and tips and little experiences that I've had, especially traveling. So whenever I'm now on these experiences in Alaska or Iceland, you know, I take a little bit of time to film, not just the fishing, but to interact with the outfit or interact with the guides and just you know, share my experience with others through those fishing tips. So that's been a kind of a nice little change for my YouTube channel. And, you know, outside of YouTube, I recently released a book that was two years ago. And I, I don't know if we talked about that. My book is called, it's called fly tying for everyone. It was just a huge project for me because it was my first book. It, you know, exceeded my expectations it, nice. it's done and, and it continues to do really well. And it's, you know, led me down to a second book. So, you know, I know you and I are currently recording end of 2023 and I'm just about to finish that book get it to my publisher then, you know, in hopes of it, you know, being out, you know, around fall of 2024. 24. Okay. And what was, can you, do you have a name yet on that? I can't really speak too much about the oh, name right. or cause yeah. it's not turned in, but the entire gist of the book is it relates to fly tying and European nymphs because that's, you know, it's just such a buzz thing right now in fly fishing. And I jumped completely down that rabbit hole and the, kind of the premise is I, you know, I interviewed a bunch of the, the top anglers around the world. We're talking people like Devin Olson, Howard Croston, George Daniel, Lubos Rosa, just all these incredible individuals. They've contributed to this project and I'm kind of putting it all together right now. And I won't say too much more, but for me being being the, the writer, I almost feel like an editor for this one. It's just been one of those experiences where I, I'm like just pinching myself. Like, do I really get to talk to all these people and hear like the behind the scenes with everything they're talking about, you know, European nymphing and competitions and fly tying. It's just been such a great little experience for me. That's awesome. So on that book, did you go in and so you kind of interview the people, do a like sort of like this sort of thing or you two or how, how do you do that? What's the interview? What's the process look like to get the information from that person? Well, it's different for everybody simply because, you know, some of them, you know, they don't speak English very well. So mm. I have to try to figure out exactly their background and determine what the best, you know, type of experience is going to be. For some, it's, uh, you know, we'll just do a Zoom call and I'll record that so I don't have to worry about taking any notes. For others, you know, maybe it's just going to be an email and I have a list of questions. And then after they fill that out, then I, you know, I contact them and we go from there. But what's been neat, it, it, it's kind of led me to more people because you start off with your base, you know, 10 individuals or eight individuals. And then I finished every interview by asking, you know, who's somebody else you recommend? Yep. And then they've connected me to somebody else. And then that person to somebody else. So I've, I don't want to say I've gotten off the beaten path as well, but I have, and I've met some really incredible anglers that just are doing so many great things right now that, you know, we probably won't hear about mainstream for a couple of years. And then when they hit the, the scene, I'm going to be like, oh, I, I knew them when. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's cool. I think that 
For us, the same thing too. That always you start something like this podcast. You're like, man, are you going to run out of people to talk to? And <laughs> and after 550 go, you know, whatever we're at now, it's still there's easily thousands more. I'm sure because there's all those people that you don't hear about yet, and they're either going to be there or they're not even. They're maybe off the map a little bit, and you're not hearing them social, but they're a su- all star. And so, uh, yeah, I feel like I could do this my whole life, and definitely there's still going to be tons of people, which is a great thing to have. I agree. Yeah, nice. Well, so let's talk travel a little bit. And um, you mentioned filming uh, in video. I'm always interested in that because how you do that, you know, you're on these trips. But maybe let's start off with we're talking travel tips. First of all, give us a rundown. You mentioned a little bit, but where have you been traveling to the last few years? Gosh, the last few years, I feel like I've been all over. I mean, if I just kind of take a step back and just to introduce myself to your listeners, I live in Western Pennsylvania. So I'll just start with that. I'll preface it that, but I tend to fish, you know, the center of the state. And then a few other places within driving, we're talking two and a half to three hours. I'm very fortunate. My wife, Heather, she loves to fly fish too. We have two small children. So whenever it's family time on the weekends, like we roll as a family. So we'll be driving around locally as a family, fishing, you know, throwing rocks in the water, having a blast. So that's kind of like my local aspect. Um, domestically in the last couple of years, my main trips have been either to Alaska or to Florida. Um, you know, I love Alaska just for the salmon out there. I've, I've just fallen in love with those king salmon and then down in Florida, you just have such incredible, you know, snook and tarpon fishing. So that's kind of the, the domestic vibe. And then whenever I think about internationally, you know, my main destination recently has been Iceland. I can't mm-hmm. tell you how many trips I've made in the last five or six years. I'm averaging around three trips a year right now. Wow. So I'll go for, for three different times. We'll say sometimes in the spring, a couple trips during the summer, sometimes in the fall as well. So I've been very fortunate to kind of visit all these destinations with the the explicit, you know, understanding that I'm going there to fish, you know, that's priority number one. And I think what led me to, you know, this podcast is it's really exciting to take a trip, no matter how small. And so many people tell me they want to experience like X species. It could just be a wild brown trout in Pennsylvania, that Arctic char or that Atlantic salmon in Iceland, maybe that king salmon in Alaska, a sea run brown in Patagonia. But there are so many things that go into making that happen and also having a positive experience. So that's why, you know, I want to just share some of the experiences, share some of my tips that I've picked up over the years with your listeners. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll we'll have links in the show notes to past episodes we've done, troutandfeather.com. Like you got a whole uh, resource on YouTube and all your video. I mean, it's a ton of stuff. So there, there's all of that, but this is going to be a kind of the next level on travel. So yeah, let's start that. Let's say we're, I love Iceland because first of all, that's a long, what well, seems like a big trip. I know maybe it's not as hard as you might think, but when you're planning, is there a big difference between planning overseas or over the ocean sort of thing versus like just driving from your home? Is that a big challenge? Say you're driving across the East or the West. Uh, is there a big difference in planning? For me, I think there is simply because when you're flying, you're a little bit more limited with what you can pack. And and that's kind of the, the one thing that people really just focus on. You know, I host trips and I do a lot of group travel. And most of the common emails really just come in or when people call me, they're just like, Tim, I'm just unsure of what to bring. And, you know, we have so many checklists and so many instructions and all these different things, but it's overwhelming because if if I'm going to be driving to Pennsylvania, even if I'm driving out West, you know, I have a nice Ford F-150. I can throw a lot of stuff into that truck and I tend to overpack, you know, that's my mentality. But whenever you're traveling, you know, internationally, or even if you're flying, you know, domestically over to Alaska you're a little bit more limited because sure, you can say, well, I I can uh, check a few more bags, which you absolutely can, but you really can't whenever you get there. If you're going to be taking a float plane, you know, into the bush in Alaska, they are going to limit you on how much weight you can bring in. There's going to be some restrictions. Plus you got to drag all that stuff around the airport. So it really comes down to being a little bit more intentional with everything you're doing. Quick break for a word from our sponsor. With more than 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee Team roasts a full range of coffee with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. Responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices, you can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. Roasted and shipped within 48 hours to assure freshness. For me, it's all about that freshness and taste when I crack open a bag of Anglers in the morning. I feel good because I know not only does it taste great, but I am supporting great movements along the way. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Anglers is serving your needs. It's time to step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes we love. You can head over to wetflyswing.com anglers right now to grab a bag of greatness today. 
That's Anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S, to make a change today. Yeah, that's right. And so it does start with the, uh, yeah, kind of the packing, the gear. How, how so if, let's just say it is the Alaska. I think I like the Alaska because sure. it does really limit you because especially if you're flying in multiple planes, yeah. float planes. So what does that look like? You're planning. So you talk, talk us through that. Are you taking um, one bag with your stuff and then carrying on a bag with your rods? How does that look? Yeah, let's go through that. Let's l- yeah. we'll, we'll do Alaska or Iceland. They're both pretty yeah, similar. Yeah, either way, yeah. So I guess we jumped into, we've selected a destination, which you could select that by, you know, word of mouth. It could just be a bucket list. Maybe you were reading your Fly Fisherman magazine. You know, you just heard of a friend. You saw something on social media. And there's lots of different reasons to select a destination. I'm someone that... I like the destination and the species because, you know, let's go to Alaska. You want to go to Alaska, but there's lots of different weeks you can fish there. So it's not just about saying, I want to go. Yeah. Well, that's always the challenge, Tim. We've been doing that. So like with, and I hear exactly what you're saying, because I've been talking, we're trying to set up a Alaska trip right now. And I'm thinking, okay, do I want to go in June to catch those Chinook and maybe some rainbows or wait, but fall, the rainbows are going to be huge because they're eating after the end of the season. So there's all that. So how, walk us through that, how you chose, you know, Uh, yeah. There's no answer. I mean, as your listeners probably can figure out too. I mean, if, if I'm thinking about Alaska, I wanted to go whenever it was peak King salmon. So it's like, all right, I'm going to base my trip around when's the best I can do. And, it, and as soon as I get there, we're fishing for these Kings. We had a great time fishing for those. You know, everyone's talking about, oh, you need to come back for the silvers because it's yeah. just insane fishing. So it's like, oh, well, what time do the silvers run? And then, yeah. so it's one of those things where I feel like whenever I make a trip somewhere, I don't want to look at it as this is a one and done. It's almost like that was just my sneak peek into that destination because I really like learning more about it. And with Iceland, I've gone so many times with that first trip. I went there because I wanted to catch an Arctic char. I wanted to turn it upside down. Look at that just vibrant orange underbelly and just, you know, just really experience that. Yeah. But then it's like, oh, well, everyone's saying, what about these Ice Age brown trout? So we had to go catch those. Then it's like, <laughs> well, what about the sea runs? So I spent a couple of years chasing sea runs in, you know, southern Iceland. Then I found out there's sea run Arctic char in the north. So I had to go up there. And then this summer we were there and, and we had a chance to, to fish a beat for some Atlantic salmon. And I was like, oh my God, this is absolutely insane. So <laughs> this is cool too, because I said, you've done like these trips multiple. I mean, so have you thought about maybe taking some of that time and saying, hey, I'm going to go to New Zealand or some other, or is that something where you really want to, you're just, it sounds like you're dialing in Iceland or is it that, is Iceland that amazing that you're just, you're going back? It sounds like it is. You're back there. Yeah. It's very amazing once you start to dial in and, and you figure out what you're trying to get out of the experience, because like you're, you, you know, you're throwing out other countries. Like yeah. there's, there's some outfitters in Patagonia who want me to come down and take a trip with them, which is awesome. But now the other side of my life is that this isn't my day job. I'm a six grade elementary school teacher. So for me to, to take trips like that, they really have to focus on the summertime right now. I'm, I'm not to retirement age yet. So, you know, trips to Patagonia are, are really difficult because, you know, our winter is their summer, you know, and, and oh, right. by knowing that, like, it's not as easy for me to get to other locations as it is for other people. So I have to also kind of factor that into play with some of my trips. But yeah, I mean, with Iceland, it's definitely one of those places that you go and you're like, wow, I'm just scratching the surface because there's just, there's so much water there. Plus it's a giant Island and and the climate's always changing and you have the Northern lights. And, you know, right now in the news, there's a volcano that's about to erupt. And when I was last there, Heather and I, we hiked to a volcano. Like we literally were inches away from a lava field that was, that was streaming at that moment. Like those experiences that you get out of trips, sometimes that's almost as good, if not better than the fishing, because you know, fishing's fishing, but we'll get back on that fishing. Yeah, we'll get back on that. This is awesome. So, so here's the question: Iceland or Alaska? You can only pick one in the next ten years. <laughs> no, don't do that to me. <laughs> um, I think each one's different, Dave. Because what was nice about Alaska, and I'll compare the two. Internationally, you know, you, you got to have a passport. You have to make sure that's you know that's current. Um, the, the rule of thumb is make sure it's not expiring within three months of your trip. That's you know, there's some countries that there's a different allotment of time than that, but that's kind of the rule. The one nice thing about Iceland, at least where I live, there's a flight right now out of Pittsburgh that goes direct. So it's a brand new flight. It's going to be running pretty soon. So you don't have to worry about connecting to other airports. Nice. And for anyone who's traveled recently, connections have. They've really just been insane for a little bit of time. I've lost so many days of fishing, which is really just a frustrating experience, especially when you have to sleep in an airport overnight. Like that's not something that's fun. It it looks interesting when you see it on the news and you see all these people stranded in an airport. But trust me, whenever you're sleeping on the floor of an airport, the music plays all night. It's not comfortable. You wake up, you just need some coffee. 
oh, it's just, it's just terrible. God. So that's the experience, right? We, you're, we've you're had talking, bad yeah. experience when you have to connect. Oh, now, that didn't happen in Alaska. The one thing that I, I loved about Alaska that makes it really unique, uh, when we flew to Alaska, we were going over to the Bristol Bay area and we, we took a flight. And we circled, gosh, I'm going to blank on this mountain range right now. But when, yeah. you know, we landed in Alaska, then we, we hopped from there over to Lake Iliamna. And on that flight over to Lake Iliamna, we got to just go over this mountain peak. But whenever I say go over it, Dave, like we were 9,000, 10,000 feet in the air. It's just plane that seats maybe 12, 15 people. It was a caravan. And the pilot says, hey, no one has a connection they're going to miss, do they? So we say no, because you talk to your pilot. I was sitting next to him. I was riding shotgun. So the pilot says, cool, I'm, I'm going to circle this one more time just so you can get another look at it. So here we are circling this mountain peak. I mean, just like a hundred feet away from this thing. I, wow. I don't know how, he, I mean, we were so close to this. Then you land, you know, we got shuttled over to Lake and then you have this little float plane that picks you up and, and then you take off, you're flying real low. You can see occasionally like a, a moose or, an, or a, a bear. And you know, when the fish are really running, you'll see like, you can kind of see them potted up at times from your plane. And then you land and, and you're at your lodge. And and for that whole experience to go down, like the flight into my lodge this summer, that was worth the, the price of admission right there. If I hadn't caught a fish, sure, I would have been disappointed, but that travel alone was just so insane. So I can't pick one. They, they both, they're really great for different things. I love that. Yeah. And that's the thing. I think the, yeah, the travel is something I've talked a little bit about this, but that's one thing I really love. Some people hate the travel, you know, the, all the stuff and everything, but I, what's your take on it? Do you love the, all the, the getting there and all that? Sounds like you kind of do. <laughs> I love the the packing part. Like we'll go over some tips for packing and yeah. that type of stuff. I love getting my gear ready. I love preparing for the trip. I love imagining what's going to happen. And I'm the person that the, I'm like ultra prepared. And I have my parking set up. I tend to, you know, drive down to a parking garage, get shuttled over the airport. And then once I get to the airport, I'm at like stress level hundred. I just want to get through security. I want to sit down. I want, you know, I'm just constantly waiting for the plane to arrive. Like I'm just, I'm just so anxious because I just know things can go wrong. And, you know, I'm just that person that I, I want everything to just go as right as possible. So because I put so much planning and so much time and, and money into these trips that, I just pray they go really well. And, and when they go well, it's almost like that went okay. Like I didn't have any problems there. And when it goes bad, it's like, shoot. And you really, it's, it's that, that positive mindset that when things go bad, you just have to know you're going to get there. It's going to be okay. You know, you're going to have a great time. You're going to catch fish, but just that you have to understand that that whole journey is just, it's part of it. It's part of it. And you just have to live with it. That's part of it. Yeah. That's sweet. That's good. I think, yeah, when I do it, I'm kind of out there just, I think I do have that optimistic. I think I try to block that out of my head, like something could go wrong and I'm just like going with it. And if something happens, yeah, you deal with it. I mean, I've lost bags and that definitely is a pain, but you figure it oh, out. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure we'll have some tips. So let's take it, keep us back on track. So go back. So we've got our trip now. We've selected the destination. All right. We got what's, destination. What's next? Yeah. For next for me is probably you have to decide if you're going to do a DIY thing versus an outfitter and both have their benefits. Um, DIY can be really fun, you know, just because you have that opportunity to kind of just do it on your own and figure it out. It's kind of like a puzzle and you're, you're putting all the pieces together. So I like that aspect of it. I tend to stay away from DIY for certain locations. You know, for instance, in Iceland, like 99% of the water is private. Oh, so right. you can buy a public pass. That's fine. But now, you know, you're going to be fishing water that, you know, I don't want to say everyone can fish, but you know, more people have access to. Plus you also can, you know, lean on the experience of an outfitter versus when it's DIY. I mean, you could fish for days and be in a really bad spot and, and have no idea. Luckily with, you know, so many online resources, you can get a little bit closer to where you're trying to get, but at least whenever, you know, we, we're talking now Iceland, Alaska, it's really, you know, beneficial to have an outfitter um, because a lot of people go into it saying, I'm going to save money and a hundred percent DIY, you're going to save money. There's no doubt about it. Sometimes. Because I've done some DIY in Iceland and you have to rent a car in Iceland and vehicles in Iceland are very expensive. Post COVID, it's over a thousand dollars a week, depending on what four by four you're trying to rent. So right now you got your vehicle, you have to book all of your hotels. You have to try to find restaurants that have good food. There's just, you know, these little things that yeah. you have to decide. I mean, are you going to go to the grocery store? That's fine. I mean, you can do that, but that's going to take time away from your fishing. So yeah. there's just that decision. Um, the nice thing that I kind of think about whenever I go with an outfitter, 
I use them for so many things like recommended items, recommended gear. I mean, they know that area. Most, you know, reputable outfitters are going to send you this list of everything that you need. Plus you can contact them throughout that experience and say, Hey, I'm thinking about this. What do you got for me? And, and I mean, that, this is their business. This is what they do for a living. Yeah. So you really want to lean on, on their experience. Plus, if you have a guide, it's not just always about the fish. Maybe there's something you want out of your instruction. Maybe you want to learn how to you know, make a cast like the double haul. Maybe right. you want to learn how to swing wet flies and, and that could be their specialty. So, you know, a lot of the times, you know, I'll speak to the guide up front and say, Hey, if you notice me doing something incorrectly, or if you think there's something that, that I'm not doing that I should be, please correct me. And that whole communication piece is something that, you know, I think is, is really recommended. It makes for a great trip because you're having that ongoing dialogue with them. And it's not just about make a cast here, you know, set the hook, you know, it's more about, you know, what am I trying to get out of this? Right. So in, in the Iceland trip, have you learned some things on that that you've taken back to your home waters and fishing? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, my first trip there, I went into it and, you know, I kind of look at myself as, you know, above average angler, especially with dry flies, emergers and European nymphing. And one of my first trips there, you know, we had the streamer game and the streamer game wasn't something that I was really used to doing. I just wasn't all in with that yet. So I had to truly up my streamer game while I was there brought that back to the United States and, and I'm a much better streamer angler. The other thing that kind of threw me for a little bit of a loop in Iceland was that one of our first trips there, we, we went to this lake and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of it. But it was a really <laughs> small lake loaded with these massive brown trout. And Jeez. I'm not a great lake angler. Like that just wasn't, that wasn't part of my, my background. I didn't do a lot of lake fishing or if I did, they were always stock trout, a lot easier to catch. So I end up in that lake. You know, I, I missed my first six or seven fish with a streamer, just not doing things correct because I wasn't used to it. Then I had to just take a breath, dial things back in, think to myself, all right, if I was fishing for bass on a lake, how would I treat that? What would I do in that situation? And then I completely changed my style. I pretended like I was fishing for striped bass on this little lake by my house. And within like moments, I caught my first brown trout. It was a nine pound brown trout. I was like, oh, like that was easy, but I had to really work hard to build that connection in. And then, you know, as soon as I got back to the US, like all summer long, I just focused on fishing lakes because I wanted to become a better stillwater angler. And I have since then. There you go. Nice. So on the, on the, so the outfitter, yeah, for sure is a good route to go. How do you find an outfitter? I mean, I know you've got them dialed in. How would somebody out there listening like, oh, I don't know. Who do I choose? Like, I want to go to New Zealand or wherever, you know, where do they start there? Yeah. It's tough for me to say, because, you know, for me, one of the, the, the areas that I'm kind of known for is that I'm one of the featured presenters at the fly fishing show. So it's mm-hmm. this show that, that has a bunch of shows around the country, like Edison, New Jersey, Denver, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There's one in Atlanta. And because I'm a feature presenter at that show, I get connected to a lot of the outfitters there. And what I've learned about outfitters, uh, especially just about booking in general, for instance, one of my trips overseas, I was over there. We were doing really well. I'd posted something on social media and a good friend of mine had been there that same week as me. And after like the second day, you know, he sent me a DM and was like, Hey, how's it going? I'm like, Oh, it's awesome. And I am never a person that shares numbers ever. I just thought my thing. So I just said, it's awesome. And we had done really, really well. And I said, how is it for you? And he's like, oh, it's incredible too. We got two. And I'm like, oh. two? Like, that's not a good, I'll just say that's not a good number. Let's put it that way. And, you know, I saw, so I, I just did a little bit in, of inquiring and it turned out that the guy that he had gone with was just a guy who was more of a weekend warrior, had a day job, was just, just doing this to make some extra cash because, you know, they knew that, that Americans were looking for guides. So I think that's the first piece of it that you, you have to do a little bit of homework. You got to find out their website, have a conversation with them as you, if you can, not just going by email, just to say like, I hear it in their voice. I know this is something they do. Is it their day job? Do they have a lot of guides that work for them? Could you reach out to a guide? I mean, the one thing I've noticed on a lot of my group travel, we know some of our guides ahead of time or the outfitter. And even though I'm that connection between the outfitter and my clients, some people will still just bypass me and go to the outfitter because they want to hear it direct from them. And that's not a bad thing. And and at times they'll get over there and they're already friends with the guides and they haven't even met yet. So it's nice that you can establish that dialogue ahead of time. And and that's what I would encourage people to do. Just, I mean, Google reviews recently has definitely upped and that's a really positive area too, where you can simply go into Google, type in that outfitter's name and read the reviews. Now Mm. it's going to be like anything else. I don't want to say buyer beware with those reviews, but I've noticed, you know, Google has really pushed their reviews recently and they've been pretty spot on with some of the outfitters I've been using. 
yeah, I think the reviews are, uh, yeah, kind of, you got, you're going to have some one stars, you can have some, a lot of five stars, but you, I always say, look at the middle, look at the three stars, read those because those are going to tell you some good information. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, that's on, that's, so this is good. So we got some tips. So we got the choosing the place, choosing the outfitter. What else do we have on this list here? Yeah. Well, let's say, all right. So now we got our destination. We, we have to start making our preparation. I mean, there's going to be so many areas that we'll get into like gear, you know, your rods, style fishing, all that stuff. First thing first, I always like to just look over the regulations. I like to look at this place on a map, try to learn a little bit about their culture, either going on YouTube, mm. watching a couple of videos. And I also like to see what are the recommended sightseeing spots, just because I want to know. I'm not a sightseer. I'm not a person who does well when there's a thousand people all staring at the same waterfall. That's not for me. But I still want to know, like, what are the big things that if I get back from Iceland, is somebody going to say to me, hey, do you have the hot dog in Reykjavik? And I want to know, <laughs> like, I want to be able to say, oh, yeah, I had that hot dog. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Or, you know, or, oh, now I know why there's all these sheep running around. Like, I, I want to know those things. So I recommend don't just focus on the fishing, but just learn a little bit about that region where you're going to be, you know, fishing. And then, you you know, we have to start dialing in on a couple of things like book your flight early, especially if you're going to be traveling that way. Uh, try to get it as early as you can. Yeah. How early, how early would be too? I mean, is there too early? They always say, I think like a few months ahead, right? Yeah. I, more I like, normally yeah. go six months if I can. Six months. Yeah. I try to go six months if I can. That doesn't always work that way. I mean, I've booked flights a month ahead of time, weeks ahead of time. It just different trips require different things. But if you can go six months out, that's absolutely ideal. And I'll tell people, you know, try to build in a bonus day for a lot of our clients for these hosted trips. We will say like, you know, fly in on Monday and then our outfitter picks us up on Tuesday. And that just builds in that one bonus day where if we're in Iceland, we can go to Reykjavik, we can have a nice dinner, we can tour, you can buy some gifts for home. But then on Tuesday, you know, we're fishing for the rest of the trip and then you're going right to the airport after that trip. There's no time to shop or do anything like that. But that bonus day, even though we call it a bonus day, that's really just a oh crap day in case something happens with your flight where you're that's not right. stressed to know that, Hey, we're just going, we're in Reykjavik on scooters. That's all we're doing. You're not missing anything. You're going to get here just in time for the fishing. So if you have, you know, the ability in your schedule to build in that bonus day, yeah, that's perfect. do so. It saved me many times. Bonus day on the front end and the back end or? It's up to you on the back end. I always build one in on the front end. On the back end, I'm somebody that I just want to get home. I mean, I'm just ready to like, once the trip's done, I don't need to tour or anything. I'm just ready to get on my plane, you know, fall asleep and wake up and be home with my family. Yeah, good, good. Okay, so that's so so prep. And then what about on you know gear like packing lists? You mentioned some lists. Where can yeah. somebody go? Yeah, if they want to make sure they're not missing anything. Well, first of all, shoot me an email. My email, I'm sure they can find it through my website. It's tkamisa at gmail dot com. But mm -hmm. shoot me an email. Go to my website. Click the I don't know the contact form. And ask me for my list and I will send you my list of items. I have a generic list that I share with everybody that works so well because there's so many things that you can forget and it's just nice to have something you can check off. So, you know, just contact me and I'll go through it. So this is a list of like, this is like a list of everything that basically just a general list of packing your, your trip. Yes, absolutely. I would love to get my, my hands on that too. Maybe yeah, we can of throw, course. throw a link in the show. I don't know. Can we, can we get a... So is that something we can maybe put in the, the blog post show notes? Absolutely. Yeah. That's something I like to share. Oh, without a doubt, because I mean, that list is what drives me because I'm that person that I want to start putting stuff together and I can, I'll go through some of that stuff right now. Let's talk about the notion of like the packing versus the list too, because whenever I pack for an airplane, let's go that, that route. I have three bags that I carry. I have a backpack that's considered my personal item yep. in it. I have like spare clothes, my laptop, a camera, all my chargers. And I like to bring snacks too, like beef jerky or some dried fruit, just something that, you know, will sustain me in mm -hmm. case I'm stuck at the airport for X amount of hours. So that's my backpack. My carry on, I cannot recommend this one any more than I already do. It's called the Orvis carry it all bag. I buy the size large. You can store, I can't remember how many rods, at least six or seven fly rods in the top. Oh wow. Orvis, is it called carry it all? Yeah. Carry it all bag. I have mine in a camo color. It looks cool. You know, people recognize it in the airport. Um, it's large. There's no doubt about it. It doesn't have wheels. You know, I, I got to mention this to Orvis because if it had wheels, it would be so much better to use throughout the airport. But in that bag, I keep all of my rods, all of my fly reels, extra sunglasses. I keep all of my tippet in there as well. Oh, wow. How many rods can you get in that? Oh, at least six. I can break down six. I think the longest rod though would be an 11 foot four piece and it has to go diagonal. So you, if you're bringing spay rods, that's a little bit different. You, you got to probably just carry those on or have them shipped ahead of time. Yeah. So, oh, this is cool. So yeah, basically this is a great tip. 
for yeah, whatever it is, a couple hundred bucks, you got this bag, which is instead of carrying your your little carry on whatever you would have traveling, this is that bag. Oh, this thing is the best. As soon as I get on a plane, one of the first things I say is, you know, I go to an attendant. Do they have a closet they can put it in? There's some very valuable rods in here. Sometimes I used to say like they always say yes, and in the last year I've been told no so many times. But it fits in most overhead. So as long as it fits into an overhead and you you got onto the plane early enough that you can throw one in, they're cool with that. If you can't find an open overhead, sometimes they'll ask that I just walk it to the very back row and put it behind that seat. But I've never had to, I've never had to check it. That's the positive. I, I just don't want to check it because I mean, you know how much those rods and reels cost. I, I just want to have it on me at all times. Do you throw your fly boxes in there too? You know what? That's a question I get asked all the time. I never do. I never have. I've been told by so many people that they've never had their flies taken away, but I have so many flies, Dave, that it just in my head, this is that one thing that if I get up to the security and they say, you can't bring these in, I would just be sick to my stomach. So because of that, I've always put all of my flies in my checked bag. Yeah. But I've never heard of anyone who's lost. No one's ever personally told me that they've been taken away. I just have it in my head that I'm just afraid that would happen. So okay, you can check with TSA, but a lot of the times whenever, you know, you always hear people say, check with TSA. And many times it's up to that TSA agent's discretion oh, to make that yeah, decision. So right. you, you got to really, and those, those, you know, those rules and regulations are, are constantly changing. So keep that in mind. Uh, then I have my check bag and that's where I put everything else. And, you know, typically the max is 50 or 60 pounds, depending on where you're flying. I hit the max of 50. I mean, I go for 49.9 every yeah, time I can. <laughs> yes. I mean, I bring waders and boots with me. Um, everything goes in there. The one little tip that my wife recommends, especially to female anglers, and, and it could be for, for men as well. She likes to carry on her waders and her boots. Uh, simply hmm. because if your luggage gets lost, you know, for a guy, it's a little bit easier, you know, if, if, especially if you have an outfitter, most outfitters have an extra pair of waders that that's just part of the experience. But for females, you know, sometimes oh, they, they right. don't fit as well. And one time my wife and I were, we were fishing somewhere overseas and her waders started leaking and she was cold. And the, you know, the outfitter is like, Oh, don't worry. We have an extra pair. And it was like a size triple XL. Right. And, and that's oh, not my wife's size. So she was like, I'm going to go with the wet waders instead. So because of that, like she just wants to have her own waders and boots. So she'll give up some of her carry on space, you know, instead of, you know, bringing other stuff. But I kind of look at this for my backpack and carry on. I want to have enough stuff in there that I could survive for a couple of days fishing in case my luggage gets lost, you know, just exactly. have a, a spare you know, change of clothes. I bring a windbreaker slash raincoat that I get into that. So, and then the other thing, this could be a positive for some or a negative. I like to put those Apple air tags in my luggage. So I'll put them in my rod bag that carry it all bag and in my checked bag. The downside of that though, is, you know, if that air tags not around other iPhones, you'll get these alerts that, you know, it's lost. And oh, right. that's the one downside. Like I was flying, you know, across the Atlantic ocean once and my phone said, you know, cannot find luggage. And here I am thinking, I thought my luggage is below me. It should be checked on. But now because of this stupid app, it's telling me it can't be found. So now I'm stressed that like, when we get there, is my luggage going to show up? So if you're not good with, you know, knowing that stuff, then don't get the air tag. But for me, I just like having that, that little extra sense of security. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Cool. Well, the Orvis carry it all. We'll put a link in the show notes to that. So on that carry all, so you not only put all your, you know, your fly gear, your rods, but you also put some like a change of clothes in there and some things like that. Yeah, exactly. Change of clothes, you know, a pair of like boxer briefs, some extra socks, a uh, t-shirt. I can get my raincoat in there. I mean, I can get a lot of stuff in that thing. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. All right. So that's part of the gear. What other tips we want to throw out here as far as steps? All right. Well, let's see. We're starting to pack. The other thing, if I pull away from packing for one second, um, I'm really going to recommend, now we go back to that flight. We booked the flight. The one thing I didn't mention there at the end of your, you know, your, your online flight booking, I first say, I always prefer to book with an airline versus a travel search engine simply because when you get there, if things have to change, there are times that, you know, we book through, I don't know, kayak or something like that, that they, you know, whenever we went to make a change, we couldn't do it. They had to contact somebody at kayak who then had, you know, because we had like, there was an issue with my wife's maiden name, you know, something along those lines. Uh, so I always now I just book flights with airlines just so I know it's just me and them. So I can, you know, it's a little bit easier. And then at the very end of that booking, they'll ask if you want travel insurance. Mm. And that's one of those moments where I used to always click no, but I can tell you as flights have just been delayed so much and you could lose days with outfitters. I've been clicking yes on that button a little bit more. 
so I would kind of encourage people to at least think about that and you know check out what that it, what it says in terms of that airlines. You know, what do, what does it say when you? Because I I typically don't even read that. Like, yeah, what does I know. It say? Well, it basically you'll get a refund on certain things. I mean, that's what it comes down to. And and it's one thing whenever you know there was one trip where the trip got delayed. We knew we were going to miss our connecting, which meant we were going to you know miss a trip over to Iceland, and that was just a sickening feeling. So I went to the the, the agent, and the agent. I'm not saying they don't care about you as an individual, but they're really focusing on the masses. Like they were focused on getting granola bars and water for everybody. And I'm thinking I'm about to miss a, you know, a trip to Iceland. Like people don't need granola bars right now. And she was like, don't worry, I'm going to get to you. Don't worry about it. So I'm on my phone. I'm trying to, and as I'm just looking on my phone, I, we missed the next flight. So that one was going to be out. You know, we missed the time for that next flight. Uh, so I'm looking and, and all of a sudden we realize there's one more flight that's available, but it wasn't through an airline they had some type of connection with. So, you know, I, I said to my wife, like, this is going to cost us a thousand bucks, but we're going to make it there. What do you think? And she's like, I mean, we have thousands already on this trip. You know, I don't want to say what's another thousand, but right. I was like, let's do it. And then we'll just contact the airport afterwards or the airline afterwards. So we booked it. We lost about a half a day, which was definitely not bad. Um, the first thing the girl said to me whenever I called, well, you didn't click for travel insurance. I was like, well, would that have counted? And she's like, yeah, it would have counted if you would have done that. Now they still work with us. They gave us a portion back, but you know, that was an instance where, you know, it would have helped us out by spending that yep. $50 or whatever it was at the time. Gotcha. Okay. So travel insurance, something to look at. Good. So yeah. And the other side, Dave is, uh, yeah, this is something I bet you haven't done either because I haven't, but to have some type of medical travel insurance, something like, oh, to yeah. use a company like global rescue. Um, you know, if, cause you're in some of these locations that the medical care overseas in many countries is not like ours. So some of these medical insurance plans will evacuate you out, get you out of the area, get you to medical help safe, you know, just help you out. So I would encourage people just to know that, you know, things go sideways sometimes and, and you just want to know that if you're somebody that wants to have that peace of mind, look into that medical insurance, but Typically, the, the insurance provider you use for your vehicle, they don't offer some type of travel insurance. Maybe they'll offer it on like the rental car or something like that. But for the most part, if you're talking about flight insurance or medical insurance, you have to go other routes. Yeah, good. Okay. No, that's an awesome tip. These are all things we should be thinking about. So so what else do we have going here? What else should we be thinking about? Um, let's talk a little bit about the fishing. I like yeah. to prepare for my fishing by knowing what I'm getting into. And and especially domestically, we have so many different resources online. I mean, the nice thing about a lot of these destinations is there's going to be a fly shop that's close by. And so many fly shops offer fishing reports online. So I encourage people to look into that. Call the fly shop and, and just ask them, hey, I'm coming this time of year. They can't predict the future, but they can give you some, some sense of what you're going to be getting into. So call those fly shops. And then when you get there, if you have an opportunity to stop by, buy some flies, just, just support those fly shops. I mean, mm -hmm. they're a great resource. The other, you know, area that I point people to domestically is called the USGS Current Water Data. What's nice about this website is it, it tells you historical trends and the current water flows for so many watersheds across our country. That's something that I use all the time, especially if I'm fishing Pennsylvania, if I'm going out west. It doesn't always have the current water conditions on the waterway I'm going to fish, but it might have a river that's in that same watershed, which will give me an idea about it. So I always encourage people to, to check out that uh, social media is one of those things that, you know, people either love it or hate it. I think Facebook groups are wonderful. Yeah. It, it, so Facebook is, you know, it's a free social media platform. A lot of people just say, oh, that's where people post fish pictures or pictures of their grandkids. Sure. But there's this subset called Facebook groups. It's also free, but they have these groups that are associated with topics like fly tying or fly fishing or even locations like Iceland or Montana fly fishing. And if you're new to a location, you can find a Facebook group that is really just specific to that location, even fishing related. And whenever you go in there, if you just post something like, Hey, I'm going to be in, you know, Montana fishing the Missouri river in August. Does anyone have any tips? Sometimes you might see like two or three people might give you some tips about flies or what to bring, or even an outfitter recommendation. But what you don't see is so many times other people will reach out and send you a private message behind the scenes and give you additional information. Oh, nice. I, I don't know. I think the power of social media is just a wonderful thing when it's used from that positive side. And I see so many positives that come out of Facebook groups. So I would encourage people to check that out too. Togiak River Lodge is the Alaskan adventure every fly fisherman dreams of. The lodge specializes in remote and exclusive fishing trips for all five species of salmon, 
plus rainbows, Dolly Varden, and much more. Togiak is the only lodge with access to 30 plus miles of river, the best guides, the best boats, and lots of fish with little pressure. I'll be heading up there this summer, so check in with Jordan and the crew right now to find out what they have available. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togiak to learn more right now. That's Togiak, T-O-G-I-A-K, to discover that wilderness experience you've been looking for. I agree. I mean, there's some bad stuff on social media for sure. We've been having this uh, spammer, scammer guy come on when we've been mm. doing our events. And he's like coming on. He literally copied the Wet Fly Swing Facebook page and everything. And he goes on at the end and says, hey, hey, you won. You know, sign, uh, oh, grab, no. enter your credit card, right? So I'm dealing with the scam. He does it every time he comes back. We've and But what happens is we just reach out to everybody and say, hey, turn them in. And then after about 30 people turn them in, then Facebook boots them eventually. But oh it's just gosh. that thing, right? So that's the evil side. So you're talking about the good side is this yes. amazing, which it is. It's a great resource. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Don't put in your credit card. Roll yeah, it, I think everybody knows that. <laughs> don't, don't put your credit card right. All right. So we got some so fishing. So that's good. We got yeah. fly shops, social and I got media. Yeah. One more set of resources would be, you know, when back in the day, I used to drive around Pennsylvania with a topographic map and I just had like pencil marks all over it looking for, you know, squiggly blue lines. Now with modern technology, especially our phones, uh, look at things like Google Maps, the Trout Routes app, the On Water yeah. app. There's so many great apps there. Some of them you can download the maps to your phone. You don't need to be in service. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, there's these great apps, especially if you're going DIY, where you can learn so much about the water ahead of time, then have a, a map to follow, kind of point you in a direction whenever you get there. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love you said Trout Routes because that's one of our sponsors coming yeah. up here. And we're going to be doing some cool stuff with them. So I haven't even dug in fully to the trout routes, but I know the concept. Maybe talk about that a little bit. Basically, the idea is they've mapped, and I'm sure they don't have everything around the world, but they've mapped some of the the country, and you can figure out, get some intel on it is basically what it gives you, right? Yeah, I've actually done a YouTube review on their app before, only because it's nice they have a free version, and then they have, a, I believe it's called a pro version. Mm -hmm. What's nice about the free version, you have access to all this water data. You can see where there's take-in and take-out spots for boats. You can see fly shops, you know, things along those lines, and, and you just get an idea for the river and, and what's going on around it or, or that waterway. The pro version, I believe, allows you to download those maps to your phone in case you're out of service, and it just gives you a few more features that you don't get from the free but yep. what's great about these apps, especially trout routes, they started small, you know, they had mapped a number of states. Now they've mapped much more. I don't even know how many they're up to, but you know, they just continue to add these states. Same with on water app. I mean, it's just, they're doing really great things where they're just able to map all this stuff for us and, and we're able to take advantage of it. Yeah. It's amazing. So a couple of things that I just don't want to miss this. So the YouTube review, I'm going to put that in the show notes and I'll have a, a wetflyswing.com slash trout routes. We'll have some sort of a, uh, a bonus for folks that can connect there right now. They want to look at that. So, And there's other things like Onyx Maps, right? There's tons of resources. Yeah, you said it yep. yourself, Google, like everything. So have yeah. something, right? Don't go there without anything and just be surprised by whatever. No, and I guess most importantly, learn about the species you're going to catch. I mean, if, you, if you're going to, to Iceland for Arctic char, like learn about the Arctic char. Find out like what to expect. Don't just look at you know my social media and say, oh, I saw Tim holding up this 10-pound brown trout. That's what I should expect. Like that may not be the average. That may have just been you know the unicorn. So find out what to expect with that fish. Find out what it eats. Find out what time of the year it eats that stuff. Then just... Kind of focus your your fishing and your packing around what you're going to be doing there. Yeah, expectations. That's perfect. Good. All right. So we got a pretty decent list here going. I think. Um, what else do you want to add to this? Uh, what What are you missing here? We're kind of in the pack. We're in the fishing. Yeah, so we're in we, the packing. Yeah. I, let's go through just some packing things. I'm I'm not yeah. going to give everything I'm, again. No, you know, people can contact me. Yeah, where do we go if we want to take this the next step? Okay, couple things. Let's talk about just some of the things that sometimes people overlook. Number one, remember cash is king. Don't forget to bring tip money. I mean, for oh, yeah. The parking shuttle, your drivers, if there's a chef, uh, the house cleaner, your guide, like don't forget about that stuff. Yeah, where do you put your cash? <laughs> well, I'm not going to say here, it. but I keep it on. I keep it on me. I will say it's that whenever you, okay. I'm flying. Yeah, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Dave's trying to get me like mugged no, in the I'm, airport. I'm going now. more to the products. I'm going more to the products because I know there's those things, right? There's lots of products out there. Yeah. Right? Well, here's another little tip though, Dave. If you reach out to your guide ahead of time, some guides now are accepting Venmo. That's oh, a really yeah. positive thing. So you don't have to bring hundreds of dollars for that tip. You can just Venmo them right on the spot. That's another perk, which I also recommend. Don't tip up front. Wait till the end of the experience. You know, when in some of my group travels, you know, it's nice when somebody, they catch that great fish on day two and they decide they want to just give their full tip that day. 
but then it just kind of creates some potential for animosity between the anglers that are fishing with that guide. So, you know, I recommend hold that tip until the very end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. For all the places I'm going to be, even though you can find all of it online, I have it all saved on my Gmail and, and that stuff. I still will go through my Gmail and print all the documents for that trip, all the locations where I'm staying. And I put them in my backpack just so I have a paper copy of everything, just in case I lose service. You know, that's, yep. that's something that's that, you know, keeps me whenever I'm traveling internationally, I make sure I bring a converter for my phone and for all my chargers. You know, so I have a couple that I've used that there, these are just my go-to converters. Um, whenever I think about just the notion of traveling, I just like to have some type of like medication, like a leave and chapstick. Those are the two things I'm just ready for a headache. And for some reason, whenever I'm traveling and I'm fishing a lot, especially, you know, in very windy conditions, I have chapstick. Plus if my guides start to freeze, I can put that in the guides and it will help them them to freeze a little less. So kind of double duty there. Bonus tip. Nice. Let's see what else would be interesting. If you're staying in a lodge, bring a pair of comfortable shoes, just something to wear inside. You know, you don't want to be wearing the same shoes outside and, and tracking dirt. Oh, yeah. What are your comfortable shoes? Because I know mine. Mine would be Crocs. That'd be yeah, my the same. I have a pair of yeah. camo Crocs. Yes. There you go. There we go. We got the same shoe. This <laughs> yes, is awesome. I love that, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Crocs uh, are amazing. See. Let's see. Chargers and that type of stuff. I think that's probably self-explanatory now, but I also like to bring a pair of AirPods. So whenever I'm flying, especially, um, you know, sometimes your AirPods now will connect with whatever that, you know, the the screen is in your seat. But the other tip, like, you know, depending on if you have cell phone service and and even if you think you're going to have service on the plane, uh, sometimes it just goes out and that's, you're just out of luck. So I always download a handful of movies or some of my favorite shows to my phone first. Yep. Or your favorite podcast, right? Yeah, well, 100%, <laughs> 100%. So you can just like, you know, just close your eyes, you know, just do that. And then I also recommend bring a pair of earplugs if you're sharing a room with somebody oh, because yeah. so many people you know, like me might snore a little bit. So it's good to have that stuff. Yeah. So those are some of the little travel things I like to pack. Those are awesome. When you're doing your... um your trips and do you find like half the people, do you have something where people can share a room, save a little money on it or get their own room? Or is it typically like everybody's getting their own room? Um, typically for, from the, the hosted or group travel that I do, we have where people share a room. It's just that way. We've been very you know fortunate with some of the dates that we got, you know, for instance, summer 2024, we're going to have an Atlantic salmon experience on one of the, the best, one of my favorite rivers in Iceland right now. And we have the prime date for that as well. So we have the prime week for Atlantic salmon. What is the prime date for that? It's the end of July. I mean, it's just the fish are in the river. They're all over the place. And the guiding experience for that is one to one. So you have one guide for every angler oh, wow. for the Atlantic salmon. And then when we're doing the brown trout fishing, it's two anglers per guide. But because you know we have that prime date, I don't want to say you want to get as many people there as you can. Like I disagree with that. Like for my trips, Dave, and I know you're doing this as well. Mine is like a less is more mentality. So typically I bring, you know, eight people, including myself. Sometimes it's stretched to 10, but I like eight. That's just the perfect number. You know, we all get to know each other. We're all friends. So because we're bringing eight people though, most of these lodges that we have, you know, we'll rent the entire lodge and it's typically two per room. Yeah. Two per room. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Okay. So um, I still have a ton of questions here, but what what else? We I just want to get your list checked yeah, off. Yeah, let's and then keep we, going. Yeah. We'll, we'll do fly fishing stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, probably the one thing that for me being a presenter and talking to anglers around the country, there's this misconception out there that you don't have to be good at casting to be right. a good fly fisher. And I agree. You can catch fish without being a good caster, but I can tell you just in my experiences everywhere, those who can cast well and fish do much better than those who can't. I mean, I was just musky fishing a few weeks ago with a friend of mine, and uh, he had so many more follows than I did simply because he was casting further. Now, nice. in my defense, I broke my hand a couple months ago, and this was my first like oh, wow. big casting trip since I broke my hand. You broke your your yes. casting hand. A casting hand. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I'm not a person who posts pictures of my my medical issues online. But yeah, I broke my hand. We did, we went to this spot where there are these natural rock slides. And uh, I went with my family and I was seeing all these guys going down this. There were all these 18 year olds going down these natural rock slides and water. I'm like, I can do this. And, and I did. And I broke my hand. <laughs> See, the, you, this is great. Let me, so <laughs> how, Tim, how old are you? I just want to compare. I'm 44. Yes. Yeah, so I'm a little bit older. I'm more like yeah. 48, but okay. I did this. You're like 48 year. or you are 48? <laughs> no, I am 48. I am 48. <laughs> <laughs> I am 48. I was, I was out at a family event. It was at a friend's place and the kids broke out this amazing slip and slide. I mean, this was a yes. down a steep slope. Yes. The, the guy had acreage. It was this epic and nobody did it. None of the adults. But I was just like, this 
is too good. So I did the slip and slide and it was amazing. I mean, I was like standing ovation and stuff, but then yes. at the afterward, I was like, what, what's that feeling? Something's going on with my foot. The next day I couldn't walk, you know, oh like that's gosh. like yes. little stuff oh, yeah. I didn't realize because the adrenaline. But I mean, when you get into your forties, you got to be careful, right? That's part of the break and stuff happens a little bit easier. Oh, we're not going to turn this into a medical yeah. podcast, <laughs> but I could go down like 20 things that I feel have happened in the last three years. So yes, I'm with you hundred percent. Right. Okay, good. So I'm not alone in just being no, the, uh, it's I'm not the old just you. Okay, good. All right. So broken <laughs> no. hand. So that's a whole thing about learning how to come back from that. But you're casting with a bro- yeah, kind but of a recovering. I guess, yeah, the gist of this is, I mean, casting really can make a major impact in not just your distance because you know we think a lot with saltwater fishing. You know, with a lot of my trips, you know, down in Florida where it, you know, casting a certain distance makes an impact. But it's also being able to drop your fly within inches of where you say. I mean, if I'm in Montana and I'm fishing towards the bank, I want that fly like an inch from the bank. And whenever the guide says they want it an inch from the bank, they don't mean six inches. They mean one inch from the bank. And that one inch from that bank, it can make such an impact in your overall fishing. So no going into trips, you know, if the outfitter says, hey, you should practice casting, there's going to be windy conditions. What they mean is go practice casting at least three days a week. If you can find like an FFI casting instructor to teach you something else, but there's nothing worse than getting to a destination, just saying, oh, I can't wait to kill this. And then you realize your casts just aren't up to snuff. And for some, they're able to to make an adjustment on the fly and, and they are able to learn that whatever that next area of their casting they need. For others though, it can just fall apart in a heartbeat. So I really recommend, you know, you buy a book on casting, buy a Lefty Cray book, something, mm. anything just to, you know, look at these. I, I always recommend people to go to the the Orvis Learning Center, go online to their website and watch a lot of their casting videos because there are so many great resources out there. And then record yourself casting and just see if you can figure out what doesn't look right whenever you're watching somebody else cast. And, and maybe you'll notice something that will make you a better caster too. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I had a recent guest on and we were talking about casting and he was talking about he's back in the backyard with his kids and, and not just doing the pipe pipe plate, which is good, you know, try to get it within the, you know, whatever in the pipe pipe plate. But he was also saying to practice the other casts, like the the um the hook cast and some of these other things out there. What's like when you're out there practicing casting in the lawn, how how would you recommend people would do that? Is that kind of it? Just mix it up or how would you do it? Yeah. I mean, I try to be careful and I, I'm cognizant of whatever line weight I'm going to be fishing there because if you go out back with an eight weight, uh, you can really drive a lot of line with that eight weight. But if I'm going to be fishing with my six weight, whenever I'm in Iceland, then I, then I want to get out there with my six weight. And I'm a person that I really just try to find different areas of, of my yard. Like if there's a leaf in a certain spot, I'll go to so many different spots around that, around my yard to get my fly or whatever, my piece of yarn on that leaf or as close to it as possible. And I don't just look at it as, you know, I'm just going to make my straight overhead cast. I'm going to try double hauls to the leaf. I'm going to try to do like a back cast to the leaf where I'm going to face the opposite direction and land my back cast on the leaf because sometimes that's what it takes depending on how the wind is. So I don't look at it as just a nice overhead cast because I, I feel like it's so rare that I get somewhere and it's just nice overhead casting without any wind. So on the windy days, whenever, you know, you don't want to go outside and practice your cast, if you notice the wind kicking up outside, that's the day you want to get outside because those are the days you're going to struggle with whenever you're at a destination. Yeah, perfect. And you said a couple tips. I always love the wind because that is tough. What's a, do you have a wind tip for us? Like somebody's out there and all of a sudden it's just howling. I mean, I know sometimes you have to stop and maybe you don't cast, but what would be your tip yeah. if the wind? Yeah. Probably the biggest one I have is is to to use your back cast instead. So you're almost you're going to release it when it's going back, not forward. That seems to be one that kind of helps. And and also just be cognizant of you know whenever it's going over your head, you want to make sure that you're going to use the wind in a, in a way that that fly is not going to hit you accidentally. Because I've been with people who've hooked themselves, and Ooh. that's not always a pleasant experience. No. You know, keep your sunglasses on, but you know, try to use that wind to your advantage if you can. I mean. I used to be a, not necessarily a competition caster, but I did these casting competitions and and one of the judges was Joan Wolf. And oh, wow. I remember. Yeah. And I, I was, <laughs> I was in this little group. There were like four of us and we're talking Jeez. to Joan and somebody says to Joan, Hey Joan, what do you recommend for casting the wind? And she's like, don't like very yeah, simple. Don't, don't do, it. do it. Exactly. But then she said, no, she's like, you know, you just want to move. If you can move to another location and use the wind to your advantage, but it doesn't always work that way. So if, if I have to cast straight into the wind, which I have, I won't do that. I tend to turn the other direction, let my line go out with the wind, and then power my back cast into the wind that way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah good, good. Wow, this is sweet. So um, so I, we got a whole list of tips. I'm going to start to take it out of here, and we'll, we'll jump in a few more at, at, you know, when we get out of here. But we've got this new segment we're doing, which is our, is our podcast passport segment. This is where we're, 
we're trying to do some incentivizing of people getting around and traveling around the country. So this is a perfect fit on this. So we'll, we'll have a link out, wetflyswing.com uh, slash passport, uh, where people can check that out. But this one, like you said, at Trout Rouse, we're going to provide, this is presented by Trout Rouse today because they also have a great tool. And uh, and for you, I want to just start with gear because I would love, always love to go that. You got the one, you know, luxury gear item on these trips. Like what you've mentioned, maybe a couple of them. Is there anything else we haven't listed out there that you kind of have to have? For me, a couple of things. If I'm wearing, bringing waders, you know, I like to have chest high waders that, that will zip in the middle just in case you have to, you know, if nature calls while you're out there. For my wading boots, I always prefer to have studs just mm-hmm. because I want to be secure. I don't care what they say it's going to be like. I always will have my studs in my boots. Yeah. Do you do studs and felt or just studs and rubber or what do you do? I do studs and rubber. Um, there's a lot of locations now where it seems like they're easing restrictions on felt. So if felt's allowed, felt is such a great, you know, has su- such great holding power. So if you can go get away with it, go with it. But I go, you know, boots with the, the rubber and studs. I always yeah. bring a giant garbage bag. You know, so after I'm done fishing, I can put all my, all my wet waders and my boots in that giant garbage bag to bring them back to the all U.S. Right. You know, that's something sometimes people forget about. Uh, let me think if there's anything that will jump out to me for my fly lines. I'm really just anal about fly lines. You know, I, I do a lot of work with scientific anglers. I think they just have the best lines out there. And it can be tricky because if you have a lot of fly reels, like for instance, my go-to fly rod and reel right now are made by Lampson. I have all these awesome Lampson reels. I have spare spools. And sometimes it's like, which line is on which reel? So I, on my iPhone, I, you know, there's this little feature called the notes and I have a notes page that's dedicated to keeping track of all my reels and which lines are on them at all times. Mm, so I know nice. what year did I put them on? What is the line? What's the taper? Is it floating? Is it fresh water, salt, cold water, warm water? That way I, I can say, oh, this is a six weight, but it's the wrong six weight. I need a new line for this trip. And that's probably the one thing I recommend the most is don't worry about buying a new reel for the trip as long as you have a drag. But if your line's a little old, definitely upgrade your line before a trip. And for a leader, maybe throw in a couple sink tips too, because you never know what you're going to get into. Yeah, great. Well, wow, those are perfect too. Good. So, and I'm going to do kind of a quick uh, rapid fire to take it out of here, but yeah. um so we talked about gear. We talked about the checklist a little bit. Well, I'm curious on your sunglasses. So talk about that. What, what do you like on your glasses? What's your lens type or, and brand type? I've always, because I was just talking to you, I was in there with getting the gla- the reading glasses and I was looking at Oakley's who I've never worn before, but I was thinking, wow, those are pretty sweet. But what do you do? <laughs> um, I've lost a couple pairs of sunglasses in the last two years. And I'm somebody that I love high-end sunglasses. I mean, I love Smith. I mean, there's so many. I, I don't want to just say one name. I love I know. Um, Maui Costa. Jim's. Yeah, there's there's yeah, so many Bahino. great sunglasses out there. But when you lose a couple pairs, I mean, there was one pair that I put on top of a rental car after a, just an incredibly epic day fishing. My wife had caught her first Arctic char in front of a waterfall. Like It was just an awesome day. When we got back to the vehicle, you know, I took off my gear. I put my sunglasses on top of the car and we drove off. And they were gone. So it's like hundreds of dollars gone now. So I tend to buy lesser priced sunglasses. I've actually, Dave, on the Orvis website, there's a pair of Orvis sunglasses. They're under a hundred bucks. I've been using those or maybe they're 129. They're still not cheap, but I've been using those recently. My latest issue, we'll go back to our ages now, Dave. Yeah. I now have glasses. So I'm, I'm wearing glasses again. I had Lasix back in my twenties, but I have an astigmatism. So I I have glasses now for seeing far. So I have to get a pair of prescription sunglasses. So that's the, so if any of your listeners have, have a recommendation, please shoot there me an go. email. I need a recommendation for prescription glasses. This is good. So I'll give, I was just in there <laughs> yesterday. So again, the old guy talk, but um, yeah, the Oakley's have, you know, all, at least where I was at, they've got all the prescription. I'm sure they all I'll do it. I think even Bahio, we had them on. I think they yeah, do it yeah. too, but okay. um, heard good stuff. So good. Them. So, yeah, so this is this is perfect. I mean, the, the glasses is a good conversation because you should have them for a number of reasons. One, you're not getting your eye popped out with a fly. Um, that's a good tip. I will, one other tip on the, the, the glasses because I have a pair of glasses still, SunCloud, and they're yeah. under $100, I think, for the most part. I've still got this pair of glasses I've had for like 10 years, and I didn't even know it, but Smith actually makes Sun, or that they own SunCloud now, so that's their lower-end glass. Yeah. Uh, so they're great glasses. I didn't so, know that. Okay, thanks. Yep, yep. So... Okay, for, so we're rocking gear, this. Let's, yeah. Oh, good. I was going to say for gear, I think we hit most of the big stuff. And there's yeah. some little things. Waiting staff, though, if I didn't mention that, yes. bring a waiting staff because you don't want to put yourself in one of those precarious situations. You know, they're easy to pack. Just bring a waiting staff. Make sure you have it ready to go. Like that will definitely pay dividends. Yeah, waiting staff, that is a good one. Okay, good. And 
And let's just be, well, one more travel tip. Let's talk about that. So we got this big trip from the start to the end. Do you have anything else? One more you want to throw out there, which is one we should be thinking about? My biggest one. Um, We didn't really get into clothing, you know, just understand the climate, but probably my biggest tip is going to be enjoy the experience. It's not always about the fish. I mean, my wife, whenever I, I I was telling her about the podcast and she wanted to hear about some of the tips. And I said that, and she was like, that is such a lie. She's like, Tim Camisa only thinks (laughs) about the fish. And I do. I mean, but I always tell people don't always make it about the fish because you want to catch that fish of a lifetime. Like you want that, like I want that moment. I I really, that's what I go for. That's why I plan the trips. It's always around that fish of a lifetime, but my advice, and and I do this every time um, you have to take a moment, just look up and look around because you know, people say that, what's that line? Like, you know, you, you don't catch fish in ugly places, which oh, I disagree. Right. I've caught in a lot of fish in some pretty ugly places. That's but right. For these destinations, I mean, we're, you know, Alaska, you're by Bristol Bay. Iceland is just, it, it's like you're in the, the Lord of the Rings movie, wherever you're fishing, you're by yourself, but find your moment. Sometimes it's on the water. Sometimes it's like the small things. There was this one time that we were picking and eating, eating blueberries in Iceland after fishing. And I don't even, I don't know how the fishing was that day, but I just remember we took a pause we're just walking out and somebody noticed all these blueberries. We're eating them, just, you know, having a good time, mm. just laughing, telling jokes, making fun of each other. Like that was my moment there. And, and and I said, like with Alaska, as we were flying, you know, into Lake Iliamna, like we're circling this mountain and you're just looking out your, your window. Like I, I'm trying to make a decision. Do I record this on my phone or do I just breathe it in? Right. And I had to just take it all in because it was like, yeah. It was such a moment for me right there. And then, you know, when you are fishing, you make sure that every cast counts. Like, don't look at it as, you know, I'm just fishing. I'm going through the motions. Like every cast when you're in one of these destinations could lead to something that you have no idea it's there. So just be positive. And with every cast, just know like, hey, that next fish of a lifetime could be on the end of your line. So make sure you're ready for it. That's it. That, that's what's amazing about the fishing and all this stuff, because it is, it's true. It, it's, you never know. And it seems like, and I do some hunting too. It's the same way where you're out there. All of a sudden it could be nothing. And then all of a sudden you have a you know chance of a lifetime out of nowhere. <laughs> Right. And yes, then, I'm with you. you. You hear me. So, so I want to hear on this filming really quick. Um, just the because this is a challenge for us too. I want to get out there. I want to get pictures of everybody. We've had photographers on the trips, but we haven't been doing that. How do you, when you're out there, capture you know either on video or photos? Is that you just doing it with an iPhone, or how? how do, what's your what's your tip there? No, I I bring a high end camera with me. You know, I bring a I have a Canon. I think it's an R5 uh, with a couple of different lenses. So I prefer to have that with me just because. Because, you know, I want to get those images. I want to get that video. So are you a pro? Do you consider yourself like a a pro, I mean, kind of a higher level photographer? Are you more new to it? No, I would say I'm a little bit higher level. Yeah. I'm I'm newer to it in the sense of I've been making YouTube videos for years. But if I go back on some of my early videos, the content, or the content was there, the quality of the video, I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. And then whenever I had to, you know, start working on my, my book, I had to learn a little bit more. My editor, Jay Nichols, he's fantastic. And he's like, Tim, you've been doing this for years. And I'm like, no, I just clicked the button and, and it starts recording. Like, I just didn't even know what was going wrong if something went wrong. And then I also, you know, I, I made a connection with a really incredible videographer. His name's Harrison Hughes. And, you know, we've used Harrison on some of our trips. So we brought him along as the videographer and just to see the way that he approaches his work was just so fascinating. And and he's the person I lean on now. If I was buying a gimbal, I would say like, what do you think about this? And, you know, so I kind of pick his brain when it comes to that, because the world of video is just, it's so expansive and there's so many options that you have that, you know, if there's anyone out there who wants recommendations at whatever price point message me, I, you know, I've hit all the price points I feel like over the years and I'm comfortable where I am now, at least for the next five or six years, I think. But it's tricky because you want to do this thing. You want to get there. And Dave, I know you have the same issue. It's like yeah. when you're, you have this camera and I know I have, you know, this high end camera that gets this great video and, and great photographs, but I'm also trying to catch fish. So right. you have to say to yourself up front, am I going there as a videographer and a photographer, or am I going there as a fly fisher? And for me, the, the latter always wins out. So whenever I have a moment or maybe I've, we've done everything really well. And I say to myself, well, here's a few shots I haven't got yet that I want to get. I'll have a shot list ahead of time and I'll just look over it and I'll try to get those shots in the last couple of days if possible. But mm. along the way, you know, sometimes I just have to pull it out and just say, all right, let's see if we can get a few shots here of, of this, this location, because it's just, it's so awesome that you can't miss it. 
but then you know how it goes, Dave. Sometimes you're you're in that spot, and you're, I'm like, hey, you know, my buddy Rob Janino, you know, he and I fish a lot oh, yeah. together. He runs the Fly Fishing Journeys podcast and online uh, website. And you know, I'll, there was this one spot. I'm like, oh, Rob, you got to get a video of me walking through this area. Like this is epic. We're in this like crazy canyon. Like you couldn't get mm-hmm. out of the water. And he grabs my camera and he filmed it like four times. And and I was like, awesome, cool. And you know, just the other weekend, we were at the International Fly Tying Symposium. Oh yeah, we were roommates there. And he said, hey, how did that video came, come out? And I was like, it was terrible. It was terrible. Like just like that. He's like, was it me? I'm like, no, no, no. Just when you're there, it's so memorable. But sometimes, you know, the video just doesn't come out the way you want it. So yeah, you just got to move right. on from it. Yeah, good. Okay. No, and and I think um, you mentioned the shows a couple times there. I think uh, give us a little heads up on that because we're kind of getting into show season here around the corner. What's I know you're all over the place. Are you pretty much doing your normal routine where you hit all the fly fishing shows? I won't hit them all because of my day job. I'm able to um, to offer a few of them to the show's you know CEO or president yeah. uh, Ben Fremsky. The three shows that I'm going to be hitting this year will be you know their major shows: Denver and Edison, so Denver, Colorado, and Edison, New Jersey. So I'll definitely hit those two. The local one to me in Pennsylvania is Lancaster, Pennsylvania show. Uh, it's a great show. So I'll be hitting that one as well. So I plan on doing those three shows. I'm probably lined up to do around 10 or 15 club presentations. So I'm booked as a, hmm. a, a presenter for like TU clubs or trout clubs, sometimes Zoom, sometimes in person. So I have a, you know, a bunch of those lined up. And then I also do some like Zoom calls of my own where people can you know go to my website. And then whenever I have a Zoom call that's around a topic they're interested in. So say for instance, emergers, that's a very popular mm-hmm. one. I used to guide on the, the West branch of the Delaware and I was known as the emerger guide. Oh, wow. So every now and then I'll give my presentation on emergers and I'll offer people the chance to just sign up for my, my zoom call. It's kind of like a zoom masterclass only because I know, you know, sometimes they don't have a truck club around the area. They can book me and have me come in or they don't live anywhere close to where the fly fishing show is presenting. So I, I want to also, you know, make that availability for those individuals. Perfect. Good, good. And what about fly? I always think about flies. Well, again, you've got this great resource on fly tying. So we had, didn't even touch on that today, but what's your, either your one fly or your one fly for Alaska? What's the one, if you can only take one up there? Ooh, my one fly for Alaska. Um, gosh, there's, can I give you two, Dave? Will you allow me two? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you a little break. Yeah. Get, get, just this time. This will be two. All right. We'll go into streamers because I, I love streamers up there. The two streamers that I crush in doesn't matter where I'm fishing. One is called the Camisa's Double Play. So I'm, you know, I'll do a little self-promotion here. It's sure. years ago, whenever I got into articulated streamers, I was watching some of the people that were tying and fishing these things and they just look so complicated. And I thought like, what's the most popular streamer of all time? And it's the woolly bugger. So I'm like, how can I find a way to connect two woolly buggers, but also give it a little bit of weight? Um, so I came up with this pattern called the double play. It's in my first book, Fly Tying for mm-hmm. Everyone. And your listeners can, it's on YouTube as well. So this isn't yeah. like a secret pattern. Um, I've caught so many large fish on this fly. Anytime, this is my secret tip. Anytime I'm at a waterfall like Iceland or anywhere in the U S or, you know, a nice little water drop, um, that you have to get a fly down in a hurry, that double play with one of those giant sculpin heads, like that's my go-to. So if you ever see a picture of me with the giant fish in front of a waterfall, that's the fly it's caught on. So that fly did really well in Iceland and in Alaska. And then the other fly that just kept killing fish in Alaska was the Dalai Lama. Just a, oh, yeah. a, a Dalai Lama with a, a nice little short sink tip that worked out really well for us. Yeah. The Dalai Lama. That was, yeah. that's one we've used up there too. That's a good one. Good. All so right, we, you, you've been there. You got to give one back too. Yeah. 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 Um, well, let's see the last trip. I'm trying to think what, what was the bay? I mean, it was, it was kind of that Dalai Lama. We also fished some, um, some egg stuff, but yeah, probably the Dalai Lama just because of what it is. I mean, that thing is a mega fly. It covers a lot of different things. So yeah, I, I guess, can I use the same one you use? That's, is that cheating? <laughs> well, get this, Dave. I'm glad you asked me that question because whenever I was up in Alaska, um, you know, we just had, we had, a, we had a great time up there. And at the end of the trip, you know, I said to the, the lodge owner, his name's Ryan. I was like, hey, Ryan, can I do like a YouTube video? And I can, I want to interview all of your guides and uh, ask each guide, you know, what their favorite fly is for fishing Alaska. And he was like, I love that. So, and this is, I'll give a shout out. That was Alaskan Remote Adventures. So I did okay. a trip up there yep. with them. Great experience. And um, the video, it's not yet out yet as of right now, but I interviewed all of his guides and him. And basically each guy picked a different salmon and shared, you know, what their number one fly was for that salmon. So a little teaser for everybody. If you watch for that on my YouTube channel and you're thinking about going to Alaska, their flies for those salmon were just awesome. Like it was just spot on what works. Yeah. So again, we'll put that in uh, as well uh, in the show notes. So 
Cool, Tam. Well, I will I, I will let you get out of here. I think that this has been a great episode. I think you've given us a bunch of tips on this. Um, you know, I guess any last words before we head out of here uh, with what you have going maybe in the next kind of year? It sounds like you got some other big trips coming up. Yeah, I mean, there's a few more trips. I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the Atlantic salmon in Iceland. I'm looking forward to that. It's something that when I was younger, I used to do a little bit of reading about Atlantic salmon, and it just seemed like, I don't want to say like, quote unquote, the gentleman's sport, but it just, it had this hoity-toity, you know, vibe to it. And I kind of just strayed away from it. That was just something I wasn't interested in, you know, living in Pennsylvania, you know, there's just not a lot of access to it. So whenever I had the opportunity to do a little bit of Atlantic salmon fishing last summer, I was like, oh my gosh, it was such an addiction. I think also because in Iceland, you have a a really great chance of catching one. I mean, the quality of the fish is not as great in terms of size as you might find in other countries, but the quantity is is one of the best in the world. So you're expected to catch pretty much a fish every session and it's a two session day. So for you to take a trip and say, you know, they expect you to catch a minimum of two salmon a day, like that's really awesome. And whenever I was able to get the prime week, it's like, all right, we got the prime week and the expectations always two fish per day. So you can just say to yourself, like, again, that doesn't mean we're going to catch them. But when you put yourself in that situation, I'm looking forward to that. And then I briefly mentioned the notion of, you know, fishing for muskies. Fly fishing for muskies is kind of that next area that I've been just kind of leaning and tiptoeing into. A good friend of mine, Bobby Kish has been dragging me out on his boat and I don't think we've had a day where we haven't seen a fish or, or landed a fish. So we've done like really well with musky fishing on a fly. And nice. I, I'm just, I'm trying not to go all in with it, Dave. You, you know how know. this is. Like there's oh, so yeah. many species out there, but man, is it just so much fun. And whenever you just catch one of those, I mean, it's, it's, they call it the apex predator. And, it, and whenever you, you look at it, you're like, I get it now. So yeah. So you've had an opportunity at, at a fish. At a muskie? Yeah. I've la- I mean, we had one day where I landed a muskie. It was awesome. Like everything was great. It, it, everything was just the way it should. I landed it. You know, you you take your picture, you release it, you're, you take a breath, you know, you're, you high five. And I made like another cast or maybe three more casts and I got another one. So to, oh, to land like two muskie and like, I, I, I can't remember now. It was like two casts and two muskies and three casts or something. I oh, mean, wow. I land that, we released the second fish and I'm like, I want to get a third now, you know, and, it's, and, and he's like laughing, like this never happens, Tim. Right. I'm like, well, it does now. Like this is the expectation. <laughs> what do you love about the muskie? Because I we're we're actually trying to plan a trip here this next year up for muskie. Haven't done it yet. What do you love? Because there is a lot of pain. It's like being a steelhead fisherman, right? But what, what do you love about the muskie? That whole experience. The, the seeing it follow is probably the oh, yeah. what really gets you going. I mean, there was this one situation where and we were we were throwing pretty large flies last time, you know, ten weight to twelve weight rods. Mm, and wow. at one point, I'd made this cast along these lily pads, and and I'm stripping in, you know, some type of feather game changer, something along those lines. And Bobby's retrieving his fly to my left, and Bobby's fly was a little bit closer to the boat, and, and whatever color he was throwing, it just caught the corner of my eye, and I just kind of turned and. And I watched his fly come in because you never know when one's just going to, they could be tracking underneath it. You just don't see them. So I'm watching his fly and I just, as it gets close to the boat, he starts to figure eight it and I turn back towards my fly. And in that just brief, Dave, I don't know, a, a second that I turned away, this muskie swam out from under those lilies easily in that four foot range. I mean, it's it, the, the muskie of a life. God. And I like yell, like, I'm not going to do it right now. I don't want, I'm not going to. No, like a kid. Just, like a, like I was a, like, a kid. ah, you know, like. I was just so, sh- I mean, we'd seen so many fish that day. So this wasn't, it wasn't like a, oh, there's a must. It like, we've seen a bunch that day, Yeah. but the size of it, it just was like this tanker, this Humvee rolling out and it came out and just as cool as a cat, you know, just turned around and swam back in. And like, oh. you know, Bobby's yelling, like, he's like, keep going. You know, we, my flies in the water, I'm figure eighting, doing anything. Yeah. And this muskie just kind of was one of those, like, Hey, this is my lake. You know, I'm just going to go, just came out just to inspect what's going on. Sure. And, and it was like that. Now it's like, now we know it's there. Like, you know, we want to catch it, but it's just one of those things where sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. And I love that experience. Wow. That is, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, just seeing that, that would be a fish of that level would be cool. All right, Tim. Well, I got one quick one we're taking out here. So this is the uh, the sixth grade elementary school teacher. And I I asked (laughs) this because one of my daughters is in sixth grade now and she's had, you know, it's been great, but you know, it's not always easy. I remember that age, right? When I was in sixth grade, it's a tough time, this transition. What do you, 
What would be the tip for my daughter to make sure she uh, has a great rest of the year? What, what, what is it like being a sixth grade oh teacher? Oh my gosh. Uh, first of all, I love it. This is my 23rd year of teaching. So I've taught fourth grade, fifth grade, and sixth grade. So I've, I've taught all, you know, upper elementary. I love sixth grade. It's when, you know, kids are just, they're learning about themselves. They're starting to figure out the notion of clicks and that um, right. advice for her. Jeez. Yeah. I would say, and uh, this is the advice I give to my son, who's only a second grader. But what I tell him is, you know, when you're in school, you start to figure out, you know, who the kids are that are the good kids and those kids who aren't. So my recommendation for your daughter is, you know, just gravitate towards those good kids and, you know, just find the kids who are doing good things, who are nice people and, you know, find a way to become friends with them simply because, yeah, perfect. You, know, the, you know, it stinks as a, as a teacher too, because you see kids going in different directions. And I know you, and you, you do everything you can to just say, you, you got to pull them from that situation. And sometimes you can make that impact. Sometimes you do, and you don't find out that you made the impact for years later. And other times, you know, it just doesn't happen. So that would be the advice and, and watch out for that social media because for people like you and me, Dave, like I've been posting for YouTube for years. I've been lit up on YouTube. I have meme accounts about me. I have like- Oh, so you got the same stuff. Yeah, you got no, all sorts of I stuff, I right? Mean, I have that stuff. Like, it, but it, and, and I'll tell you this funny story. There was this one time- <laughs> You're going to yeah. laugh. So I was interviewed on Tom Rosenbauer's podcast a number of times. And right before the first interview he had me on for his podcast, like the day before the memes had come after me for something and they were just lighting me up on Instagram. It was just like over something so insignificant and so foolish. But, and, and to me, I'm just a person where I'm like, delete, I don't care. Like you can yep. say what you want about me. I'm pretty secure on who I am. And, um, I just remember I was so bothered because I'm like, if Tom finds out about this, he's going to cancel me. He's not going oh, right. to, he's not going to want to associate. So, you know, here I am like the next day, you know, I call him, he and I are talking just like you and I did prior to this. And, and I say, Tom, Hey, I just got to give you a heads up the memes that they're after me right now. And I just, I just want you to know about this. And he's like laughing hysterically. He's like, I love the meme guys. He's like, I love to comment on them. He's like, I follow all, all right. them. Like, <laughs> and, and Tom and our friends to this day, I just had dinner with him like a couple weeks ago and he still loves the memes. Like he'll be looking up the meme. You know, oh, he's accounts. playing with the memes. He, he's, he's he loves it. And he'll accounts. share the memes with me. And it's so it was luckily it was not that big of a deal. But the reason I say that to me, like it didn't matter. It was because it, it, it could have impacted somebody else. I didn't want it to, but I'm, I, you know, I've, I'm secure in knowing that I know what I'm doing. I'm a, I'm a good person. Like if somebody wants to say something negative on YouTube, I'll either delete it or just ignore it. It just doesn't bother me. But now when I go back to sixth graders, it's yeah. such an impressionable time of their life. And as an adult and as they're, they're, you know, as you and I being fathers, like we think, oh, this is nothing. Like what they said was so insignificant, but for someone that age, it really can infect them. And I think you just have to be cautious of what you allow your children to see on social media. And it's easy for me to say, oh, you know, we're, we're going out to dinner. Here's a phone, go on YouTube for a little bit. You know, it's easy to do that, but sometimes you got to say, you know what, let's just put these devices away. Let's move on from these. And I will say just for one final quick story on the devices, this is a good example of just the kids, you know, so my daughter's in sixth grade, she's got this friend, our neighbor who's in seventh grade and the friend, the neighbor has kind of, she's almost, she's in seventh grade now. She can't play with my daughter because she's kind of in the sixth grade. So it's this kind of this weird thing going there, but that seventh grader also got caught from her mom or whatever, like watching porn on her oh, cell phone. No. Oh, no. So, you know what I mean? Like that's the sort of thing you're like, whoa, okay, we're, <laughs> we're at that level yes. now. That's what's oh, scary. Oh gosh, that's I know. What's scary. And, which, by the way, there are so many kids out there who are very responsible, who are great yeah. with it, who are like, I'll make a joke and say, like, to a, a child, you know, get off of Snapchat. They're like, I don't have Snapchat, and I'm like, which is, it's nice because some kids are still, they are that, like, they, it's just, it doesn't even come into their their gravity, you know, or their their idea. But for others, it's just, it's easy to open up like an app like TikTok. And I don't know if you're into TikTok at all. Like, I post yeah, on TikTok, not much. but at times I'll watch it and I just get sucked into it. Now, mine are all like fishing TikToks, but for, you know, for a child, for a 12 year old, some of the stuff they show on some of these platforms, is, it's just not good. And, you know, I just say, be cautious about what they're watching. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Well, we took it down a little road there. So yeah, new, we we, <laughs> we've been all over the place now. So I think, uh, well, Tim, I think we'll just leave it there. We'll kind of yeah. try to respect your time, but uh, we'll send everybody out to troutandfeather.com. And if they want to check in with you with trips and, you know, just any questions about fly tying, but yeah, Tim, thanks again for the time. Again, another great episode today and, and we'll be in touch. You're welcome, Dave. And as I love to say, thanks so much for what you're doing for fly fishing. You know, to complete more than eight podcasts is an achievement and you're in like the hundreds. So, you know, you know, on behalf of the fly fishing community, thanks for everything you're doing for us. That is a wrap. You can grab all of the show notes at wetflyswing.com. 
And please follow us on Instagram and share this episode out with someone you love. Please send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com if you have any feedback or want us to put together an episode on this podcast for you. Check in anytime. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and would love to meet up with you on the water. We have new fly fishing schools going all year long and all around the country. So if you want to connect, let's do it right now. All right, time to get out of here. I hope you have a great evening. I hope you have a great morning or great afternoon wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping by and checking out the show today. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.